partners in the community with integrity and consideration for future generations. And with that, zoning amendment B202103, who's doing anything, if anything? We're swapping the agenda around. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. We're going to do um, number three. Yeah, number three. Subdivision and Development Servicing Amendment Bylaw report and attachments to be distributed. And have they? Three? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, am I good to start? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to go. Okay, good evening, uh, Your Worship, members of council. Um, this evening, I'm going to uh, give a brief presentation on some amendments that we're proposing to the subdivision and development service and bylaw that really deals with um, primarily a pre-design report stage. Or introducing a... That's not working either. So um, a bit of introduction and background here. So why the need for these changes? Um, I think it's fair to say that all stakeholders find um, there's some confusion and some consternation around the process as it currently stands, as it's not clearly defined and, and, and formalised. And recent applications have kind of highlighted that the issue um, for us. So in terms of what's causing the issue, there's some ambiguity which leads to a lack of understanding or sometimes finding uh, creative ways around not meeting the intent of the systems and, and processes. Um, one of the other issues we have really is that there's no process that actually defines, so there's no illustration of how the process flows, so there's no flow chart that currently shows how you navigate through this quite complicated process. Um, and the, the schedules in the current bylaw aren't formatted in process sequence as well. So you don't start at the top and work your way through the process. It's you have to start in one area and then jump to another one and jump to another one. So if you're not familiar with the bylaw, it can be quite confusing to navigate your way through as well. Um, and that will actually be addressed in a subsequent uh, amendment, likely beginning of 2022 next year. Another, another reason is that we are actually already providing this pre-application um, service, if you like, uh, but it isn't defined and it doesn't have any fees associated with it. And because it isn't clearly defined and understood, it takes up a lot, large portion of everybody's time. Um, and therefore it, it tends to be uh, inefficient, inconsistent, and not particularly fair in some cases because um, some applications get a more time dedicated to them than others. Okay. IT doesn't seem particularly happy this evening. I wasn't you. I mean, the system, <laughs> not the person. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm going to do some programming now by the looks of things. Okay. I can't find the cursor. <laughs> oh, 
for you. There we go. <laughs> I, I could ask you a question, though. Sure, go ahead. So if I'm understanding what I'm understanding so far <laughs> is the pre-design approval, we're moving the $500 minimum 3% fee to the front to cover our staffing costs through that pre-approval process. And as well, that sets the stake for us to move forward through a more planned design process where council, when upon variance, will receive design drawings before we're asked the questions. Has this addressed that? Yes, yeah, so, uh, so there's a couple of points, but essentially yes. So in terms of the, the fee structure, currently the fee structure is three and a half percent of the cost estimate for construction. But there's only one real review stage in the process, which is the detailed design stage. So right now an applicant has to make application. They're entitled to one pre-application meeting yeah. and then they have to um, submit the complete design package, which is the design drawings, all the engineering, everything. Without any. And there's no intermediate step. There's no consultation step, you know, which which goes against industry practice. When you, you deliver a construction project, you generally work up pre-design just to make sure that generally you can make this work. And then once you're happy with that business case kind of decision, you then move forward to detailed design. So the amendments are really trying to mirror that process. And in terms of the fees, so that three and a half percent is currently all kind of back end loaded, if you like, onto the detailed design. We'll take um, the half a percent and bring that into pre-design and then keep the detailed design at three percent. So basically the fees should stay the same. Oh, I thought I reversed that in my head where three percent went up front and the half percent came at the detailed design. Other, other way around. OK, other way around. Because generally, and, sorry, the, 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 um, the, the pre-design it's a, it's a less rigorous process than the detailed design. At what point would council be asked about a potential variance? So with the introduction of the pre-design phase into the process, there's, there's two opportunities, but both opportunities to uh, to seek variances are done after that design work has been completed. The pre-design. Yep. So you can so you have to do the pre-design, and then you identify variances at that stage, and then they will go forward to council if required. And then when you move on to the detailed design stage, then you may identify variances again. So once you've done the, enough detailed design work, the variances will then come back to council at that, at that point as well. So there's, there's two opportunities. I guess an, uh, a follow up question would be what standard would that pre-design be to and how changeable would it be after those variances were applied for? So pre-design, the amount of information on the pre-design depends on the project, obviously. Um, and one of the changes that we have made with these and proposed amendments is to define the criteria. So when you submit a pre-design, it needs to have this information. You need to cover these areas. OK. And then the same for detailed design. Um, so if you work through your pre-design, identify a variance, that variance comes to council, council approve the variance, and then you move on to detailed design, and then you realise that that variance is no longer valid, then you go back up and you have to reapply for that variance again. Appreciate your answers. Thanks. The um, pre-design, uh, as I understood it, is a, or designing is based on a percentage of the costs, and so 3.5 percent. But I thought it was uh, for pre-design, um, the 0.5, but not less than $500. Is that, yeah, that's correct. You worship, yeah. Good enough. Thank you. Um, carry on. Oh. I mean, I, I luckily I did actually print off the two process flow charts, um, which is the crux of the discussion. So I can hand those out if sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, Karen, did you have a question I, just while he's? I freshly sanitized hand. <laughs> <laughs> My quick question was 
um, on the wording of the bylaw on page two of the fees amendment bylaw. Um, I got the fact that it's 3% for the detailed design and 0.5% uh, for the pre-design phase, but on the wording of the bylaw, it says the fee is calculated when you're talking about the detailed design. It says at the top, 3% uh, of the total construction value, and then it says the fee is calculated at 3.5% of the consultant's engineers, sealed construction estimates. And then on the pre-design, it says 0.5 of the total cost of the construction value, and the fee is based on 0.75 of the consulting engineers. So there are errors. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, I, I, I just wondered, could we tweak those? Yeah. Yeah, so just to clarify, it's 0.5% it's for pre-design, 3%. And then the assessment design. is 0.3 and the same, 0.5. So using the fee is calculated, it would be 3% and... Yes. Got yeah. it. Cool. That was my only thing. So maybe while we're waiting, we'll um, discuss the, the, the two flow charts. Um, so the first flow chart you have in front of you there, um, which looks at the the overall process. Um, the, the the smaller one of the two. Yeah. I was going slow there. <laughs> Is this the third one? <laughs> Say what? Oh, okay. <laughs> the floor chart. They're talking about. So if we look, if we start with figure B one, they're both B one. <laughs> yeah. So the subdivision and development servicing bylaw process, which is this one. So the, the intent of this one and the reason why I put it in the bylaw is because it, it, it's designed to clarify where the subdivision and development servicing bylaw process integrates with the other various approval processes in, in as much as the, the, D, the DP process, the subdivision process, and the building process. And there are a few more steps, but this is really focused on just clarifying when the engineering submission is required and what triggers it and how it integrates. Um, so as you can see there, just very sort of quickly, that the, the pre-design stage is being introduced at the top there, and the next stage down is detailed design, and there's a variance approval stage in, in between those two things. Um, and then once you have gone through the whole process, you get your certificate to commence construction, and then you can see from the blue line there, we have the planning and approval phase and the construction phase. So there's a, a clear delineation between what is planning and what is approvals and, and what is um, construction and what you need to obtain in order to go ahead and start construction. So that's the reason why that one is introduced into the bylaw. Can I just ask a question? Because given the Councillor Scarrow's question about where does the variance fit in, this the flowchart appears to show that you get your zoning and your DP and then you flow through to the engineering and then the pre-design. So that seems to contradict or, or, or demonstrating a, it's more, com yeah, it doesn't show that, that there's a link between the variance approval and the DP in the flowchart. So, so through your worship, that's a really good point. So the tool that we use to vary the SDS, or subdivision development service by law, are development variance permits. Mm -hmm. That's that's the mechanism for, for formally requesting council to, um, to consider a variance to that to those technical specifications in that bylaw. So the variance approval to a DP is something completely separate. So a DP with variance is a is a separate process altogether and deals with DPs or or zonings, for example. Um, what we're what we're talking about here when we say variances are development of variant permits, which are the tool, the only tool that we have for council to consider variances of the subdivision and development servicing bylaw. Yeah. 
I, I, I still don't see the connection between, the, according to the flowchart, how we leap, loop back from the pre-design report to the variance approval to the DP or the DBP, because it looks from the flowchart like you've already, we've already approved the DP and then it goes to your pre-design. That's correct. That's that's how the that's how the flow should should work. So, in terms of you know the I guess the hierarchy, you you need to have your DP in place before you then because your DP is your higher level concept plan of what it is you generally plan to do on that site. Right. And then and then once you've got that approval, you can then go into the well. Okay, how am I going to deliver this now? So what, then it would come back to council as a DVP. Or would it be decided by yourself as the engineer? Because it'd be a technical variance. Huh. So through your worship, I'm not clear on the question. So could you just clarify? Sorry, sorry. So the flow chart shows you go through the development zoning and the DP, then the flow chart shows it goes to the pre-design report, at which point there is a variance approval. Mm -hmm. But when Councillor Scarrow asked the question, it was un what I understood from the response was that it would come to council as a variant DP with variance to allow after the pre design phase to allow council to make a statement. But according to the flowchart and from what you just said, council has already made a decision on the development permit, but without seeing the variances that are required. So, yeah, sorry. I'm so three worship. So, and, and this is what this process is trying to to do is to almost kind of delineate. And you know, in the past, there have been instances where you know DPs have, have been used at all to permit construction to take place. Right. Well, the, there's only most of the time there's there's two main tools that we we use to permit construction. One is the certificate to commence construction of the subdivision development service bylaw, and the other one is a building permit. So when it comes to looking at the DPs, a variance to a, a DP is different to a DVP, which is varying the technical standards uh, of the bylaw. So the time you, the time you, you've kind of almost dealt with your your DP stage and you've moved on, you've said yes, that plan is meets the OCP guidelines, is generally in accordance with the OCP. You then move on to okay, well. How do we physically construct this now? And what are the technical specifications to to construct whatever it is we're we're building? And if working through those specifications, if there's a variance required to those standards in the subdivision development service bylaw, the tool that we would use to to make that application to council that variance would be a development variance permit, which is again confusing on the title, but that that is the the only tool that we have to formally um, uh, vary those standards to that subdivision and development servicing bylaw. Mm -hmm. OK, so the DVP is different to. We're using the same wording in two different contexts. Are we? So we have we have a, a DVP development variance permit. Yeah, which is that tool for varying any bylaw. Yeah. Um, and. We have a development permit with variance, right? Which is a, de a, a variance to a development permit. So those two are, are, are different things. And I'm probably going to hand this over to somebody else who maybe can explain yeah. this a little bit better than because I can. When we are talking about the development permit with variance in the chart that we see as part of, I think it was the zoning bylaw, it's called a DVP. So it's using the same three letters mm -hmm. to describe two very different, two, or two things that occur at very different times in the process. Yeah, and, and it's the it's essentially the same tool. Right. OK. Yeah. OK. And I, I can see that the, the, the should be able to fit it all in mm -hmm. along the same line. Just so sorry to interrupt there. So as the flow chart works, the first variance is in that first bracketing of the green boxes. I mean, I'm, I'm a color guy, so I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. So you've got variance approval in that section, so that's varying the the general rules and then when we get to the you know brown orange whatever you want to call that that's where the individual variances might come for mm -hmm. hardships in that particular 
that's how that works. Yeah, so, so that little bracketing there is for the, the development permit and the S is for the actual construction. That's right, because every process that we have has to have a, um, a, a stream, if you like, to be able to vary those standards, because that's obviously, you know, yeah. for the most part, and again, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, and I'm sure that the quarry will, will pick me off if I am. But um, so, so they're those, those particular mechanisms for varying those particular processes. So like I say, the, the, the variance approval process for um, DPs is, is different <laughs> to the tool or the variance process for subdivision development service and bylaw specifications. I, I have a, oh, um, I'll get you, Corey. Um. Thank, thank you. I'd just like to um, maybe offer a little clarification. This is exactly why in the development approval procedures bylaw, we separated development permits from development variance permits. Because when you combine the tools, into an, a single document, it becomes very confusing what the differences are between the tools because the words are so similar. So the development permit responds, as Matthew has said, to the guidelines in the official community plan. A development variance permit is something quite different and allows us to vary provisions of a regulatory bylaw. Mm -hmm. So very different tools, named almost exactly the same thing creating a lot of confusion but it yeah. is it is that reason i like to separate the two things so that we can be really clear about what we're doing can't we change can't yeah. we change the name of one of them to apple pie or something <laughs> we wished hey that would be so much easier i think you might need to just use different wording in your green and your orange boxes then to make it clear that you're talking about two distinctly different processes yeah um, I had a question a little further down in the brown. Um, you have a uh, certificate to commence construction before you have the servicing agreement. And I thought the servicing agreement should be <laughs> priority in terms of whether we pay for them or somebody else does. But, uh, so, so um, Mr. Mayor, your, your notice that the servicing agreement is a dashed line because the servicing agreement doesn't always come into play so it's, it's a bit of an optional item uh, but in every instance you need a, a certificate yeah. to commence construction before you start construction so that's why there's that that, that dashed line that's what that means yeah isn't it? yeah so it's not it's not a not every it's optional construction has a servicing agreement okay good enough i'm just going to try and bring my presentation back we up. lost corey again There somewhere. All right. Any other questions for? Mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay, this is where I think we were. Um, so, in terms of the key key changes that uh, we're proposing. So like I said, the main one really is, is this pre-design pre report um, stage, which actually is it's just a relocation of a phase. It's already in there, but it's it's only requ a requirement for Schedule Q, which is hillside developments. And the proposal is to make it a requirement of all applications, as you know, for the reasons that we discussed earlier. Um, fee structure, I think we've, we've probably covered that one, um, notwithstanding obviously the, the changes that need to be made uh, with the wording on those. The next one obviously is that we need to amend the fees bylaw uh, at the same time, and that's part of council's package. Yeah, it, it's just it's got to reverse. No, that's that that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, and the next one there updates to the design brief requirements. So section B8 and, and section F1 talk about the. The information um, that our applicants are required to provide under each one of those stages, so the pre-design report stage and a detailed design stage, just to make sure that when applications come in, that they're a consistent package and they're not missing any information. And again, the applicants are clear as to what information we're seeking and we need to be able to do that assessment. 
And then as you see that with the handouts, uh, there's an addition of, uh, addition of two flow charts to help clarify the, 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 the processes. So I've actually I've actually included these into the bylaw. I think they're important enough that they should go in there and they don't they don't currently exist. So I think it's it'll be helpful for everybody to be able to point to the process and understand where they are in the process, because inevitably people think they're down at the construction phase um, and they haven't even entered the process yet. So as you can see, when you map it out, actually there's a lot of, there are a lot of steps currently built into the bylaw. And then the other the other change is the um, inclusion of the variance step in the uh, the process and uh, some clarification in terms of this inspection fee, which the inspection fee was always in the bylaw, but there was no actual fee associated with it. So we've, we've included a, a fee for that in the fees bylaw. So in terms of the, the, the two flow charts, um, when we move on to the subdivision development servicing process, excuse the wiggly lines, but you can see I've highlighted there that they're the two changes. The rest of it's just mapping out what's currently already in the bylaw and put it into a, a flow chart. So you can see that we have in purple the, the relocated pre-design step that's taken out of just a scheduled queue requirement and now is a requirement for all applications. And then we've added on the right there, highlighted in orange, the, the new step for, for dealing with variances. Again, you know, it's just formalizing a, a process. So there's there's a consistent amount of work that's been done to evaluate the design before those variances come before council. Um, Car or Councillor Reed. Sorry. Is how we're in council Just because I'm a flowchart girl. So when you go, I, no problem with the splitting out. That's great. Makes perfect sense. Everything you've said. When you go down the variance line, um, are variants have been requested? Yes. Then you go through the pre-development approval or procedures bylaw applies. Then shouldn't it be a yes, no? So that you, if has the variance is being approved, yes, it would then go in to join the yes in the middle there and drop down into applicant submits detailed design work, and no would loop back up into the submit pre-design report. So basically echoing. So that should be, it shouldn't be a, a phase, you know, it reads in the other chart as variance approval, like it's going to be approved. It's not a request, it's an approval, which is not what it is. It is a request. So it would almost follow that same pattern over here. So variance approved, uh, variance requested, approved or something like that. Yes, it would join that. No, it just back up. Otherwise, it seems to imply that all the applicant has to do is request a variance and it's going to get approved, which I don't think is what you're, what's the intent. The intent is that the variance has to meet with your team's approval, your approval. So, Your Worship, I, I originally had that split out like that, but the reason why I, I put it straight back in, because in, in every instance it would have to go back through the detailed design submission. So, for example, if the variance came for council and they said no, Okay. Then, then you'd have to go and, and redo your 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 design stage. Your pre-design. Or your detailed design, okay. depending, gotcha. depending on where your variance is being requested. And if the variance is approved, you then now need to, now need to incorporate that into your into your design and resubmit it again. So okay. in every instance, it has to go back through to formalise the design. Because right. you, you either uh, have that variance approved and it affects your design, or you don't get it approved and it affects your design. Right. And then, okay. you, and then, and then that, in that case of non-approval, you keep going through the loop until you get it approved. OK. And then once you get it approved, you go through the loop and you, you have your your design stage approved and then you can carry on through the process on the left hand side. OK, but you would still have your variances that are being requested, but you would still leap over across to the left because it would have been approved. So yeah. you're missing out that that's missing that little what is what happened when it's approved. Yeah, and like I say, I did have that, but it got a bit cluttered. I, and you know, I soon realised that in every instance, it has to go back through the design process because you are you've requested an amendment to the design. So it, whether it's approved or not, you're still going to have to amend the design. OK, OK, gotcha. But I'm happy to obviously that was really, yeah. um, to, to amend that if the uh, no, council feel it needs to be yeah. clarified. No, I, uh, I understand that part of the amendment is 
<laughs> Some you got it in the trap now. B, C, D. You're right there, Councillor Sarah. As it's presented, technically it is an endless circle because it's only after the approval does it then leap across and go into the yes at the bottom there that then allows it to go into the design phase. So technically, according to the diagram, yes, it is, because there's no way to get out of it well, if you're requesting you variance. The variance is approved, but then you go up to the top again, you get your pre-design. And it and says, then, then it no. says, no, our variance is being requested. Yes, they well, are no, still are. <laughs> Request again. So we go to the no side. Doesn't that make some sense? Sort of. Kind of um, so that that they are really the, the the two big changes to the process. And like I say, um, one is a reallocation of an existing step elsewhere in the bylaw, and the other one is is, is clarification of of how the process flows. Um, <clears throat> that's pretty much it then. Yeah, so, you know, in terms of the, the kind of update schedule here, because there, there are some more schedule and um, some updates planned. Obviously, we're looking at the pre-design process now. Um, Council approved a budget request um, last year to update schedule in the stormwater one. So that's being rewritten right now, which will come to Council sometime later this year. And then it's proposed that the general housekeeping and the reformatting, which is the process order that I talked about, so essentially the, the, the each individual element of the subdivision and development service and bylaw actually follows this process. So when you when you read it and open the page, you start at the top and you work your way down. Whereas right now you don't. Like this, for example, here, this could be you know, schedule T. And then you have to go back up to B and then back down to M. Um, so it doesn't actually flow in order. So that's that's the plan for that one as well. Um, Blair had a question for you. Uh, yeah, just back to the, uh, the first chart, the um, under the building side of things. So that yellow track there, is that meant to be for building the subdivision or is that just any building? If it's any building, there's no variance process in there. So through your worship, that, that's basically building permits. So I can make that amendment to clarify that. But there would be a well, it's building, building permit application. Yeah. And like, when, and just to clarify, so this um, this flowchart really is to try and demonstrate how the subdivision development service in vital approval process fits into the overall process. Um, there is further work planned to develop and keep expanding this out so it covers all the processes in detail. Um, yeah. But I'm sure as council could appreciate it, it becomes a bit of an unwieldy beast. So um, and this is why this is why I want I was um, concentrating on getting this version into the SDS. It, it clarifies how you get to the SDS basically through the other approval processes. Um, so in terms of options, there's um, two options in the in the re report before council, uh, which is that the uh, proposed amendments be read a first and second time and that the fees amendment pre-design report read a first and second time or there's obviously two option A's there which is move A, Councilor Scarrow. Move A. If you have the first A or the second A. Yeah, yeah that's obviously a, another formatting thing. Anybody for the discussion? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I could, could um I want you to take and consider what we talked about with the closeness of the titles of the DVP and the DP. And I think that we should at make an attempt with language to separate those two titles and define them differently uh, within the bylaw. I think that that's good. The rest of the process seems to me to make pretty good sense uh, now that you've explained the, the endless loop part of it. So uh, I'm very happy with your work, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comment, discussion? Hearing none, then those in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. And back to uh, 
Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2021-003. Excellent. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, hopefully you can see my presentation. Mm -hmm. Perfect. OK, so at the outset, I will uh, apologize to Council. I'm not quite as prepared as I thought I would be because I've been away for a couple of days, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to make some good progress um, in this big project that we're undertaking. So these, of course, are the next set of uh, proposed zoning bylaw amendments. Just a quick reminder about our essential question. Essentially, do the changes um, meet the community's current needs and reflect applicable updated provincial regulations? And would the proposed changes improve user understanding and achieve council and community objectives? Where are we in the process? Well, we've agreed on some basic principles, which I'll review very, very quickly just to refresh our memories. We started the conversation and now we're uh, focusing uh, our discussion on what the intent of the changes are so that uh, we can have a fairly good um, confidence, I guess, in what we send out for agency comment, uh, Council. Uh, express some concern that we didn't want to uh, overwhelm people with multiple iterations of something. So um, these proposed changes, of course, will will lay the, the next uh, phase in the or take the next phase of the pr process forward so that we can get those out and we can start to hear from others um, so that their voices are join our conversation. So that's that's where we are. Um, Again, the principles are that zoning is intended to control land use. Height setbacks and lot coverage can be used to define the building envelope. Density of use is more important than what the building is called. And restrictions on building form sometimes can limit innovation a bit. So we're keeping that in mind. Where there's overlap between definitions, um, there creates confusion. And as you can tell that it's an ongoing theme with staff trying to eliminate as much confusion as possible. Regulation should be separate from those definitions, again, for consistency and clear understanding. And both communities and uses evolve over time. So the bylaw language should also evolve. So. We've talked about definitions being clear, easy to understand, and using current language. The regulations, whether they're contained in the general development or specific use regulations, should also be clear, easy to locate and understand, and succinctly outline the terms and conditions for individual uses. So this package of information comes to you in the similar format to the previous one when we considered residential and care facility uses. I provided you with a group of comparison tables summarizing what the existing zoning bylaw uh, definition and specific use or general use regulations are around a certain topic, what the alternative definition is that we propose, and what um, specific or general reuse regulations apply to each of those uses. So again, that streamlining. So there are four proposed bylaws in this package, and these deal with accessory, agriculture, temporary accommodation, and food and beverage. So we're taking on two of the groupings this evening um, of of the various groupings that we identified in one of those first meetings. Also included in your package, of course, are the uh, bylaws themselves, and uh, they present the information in a more simplified format in that sort of legal way that they must in, appear in a bylaw um, for the purposes of updating the zoning bylaw itself. So the first uh, group, I guess so we have uh, uh, schedules A or attachments A and B to the report focus on residences on agricultural land. And there are a bunch of different things that have been put forward here. And we find today just early on, and unfortunately I haven't had a chance to digest the information, but once again, the Agricultural Land Commission is changing their regulations as of the end of this calendar year. 
And so they have put out that they're going to take um, a more lenient uh, uh, perspective, I guess. And I, I, I find it almost humorous because I have to say in my 30 years of practice, the pendulum has swung from one side back to the other. And uh, more recently, the pendulum seems to be uh, swinging a little more erratically. So difficult to keep up. So we are a little bit uh, fortunate in that we'll have the opportunity um, to digest the changes they put out today and incorporate them into whatever we move forward. What they're suggesting by the my very cursory look at it this afternoon is that they are going to allow additional uh, dwellings. And of course, every time there's a change, uh, usually there's a change in the language. So we'll want to make sure that we're consistent. But the things that we were looking at first off in this group of um, revisions was full time farm worker housing um, because we now have full time and temporary farm worker housing. So we need to talk about what is a full time farm worker and what is a temporary farm worker and then what are the housing types that go with those things. Um, it's uh, a little past overdue for us to talk about the farm unit being an, a, basically a group. It can be a group of properties rather than a single property. So we'll talk about that and we, and we also to bring us into a uh, similar position with neighboring municipalities, which are considered leaders in the province on these issues. Um, we'll talk about the farm home plate. So establishing a limit on the area that's designated um, for residential and associated um, accessory uses to that residential use so that we again it's another mechanism to protect um, agricultural land even within um, the agricultural definition one of the things that we'll talk about in the next steps you know we've talked about okay let's let's deal with the definitions and the regulations first and then we'll go back and we'll revisit each of our zones to make sure that we are understanding the intent of each of those zones and reflecting it appropriately through these changed definitions and regulations. One of the things that we'll um, for sure do is incorporate um, these pieces as well. Um, I will likely make the recommendation that we have two different agriculture zones, one for land that is located within the agricultural land reserve and one for land that is outside of the reserve. While we as a community might prioritize that for agriculture production and we want to protect it, even though it's not within the reserve, sometimes it is easier to have two zones that are just slightly different um, to get over creating a bunch of confusion in a single zone. If this, then that. If this, then that. You know, um, too many uh, it's, if statements in a yeah. zone make it difficult for users. So we'll probably try to separate those two things out. But that's for later down the road. What we want to talk about now is is the definitions. So things like agriculture, simplified definition, talking about uh, the use being for the growing of crops and the raising of livestock and including apiculture, which is, of course, beekeeping, becoming a much more prominent thing throughout the valley as um, our bee populations are threatened, we're finding a lot more people are um, becoming beekeepers. And so we need to be able to address those types of uses, um, whether they're on smaller residential properties or large farms. Obviously, there's a pretty big difference, but there are some interesting um, factors to take into account when you're talking about that use. So this um, set of proposed bylaws brings forward a definition for those things and some general regulations for those things um, so that we can, in fact, answer the questions. We're not sort of leaving the public hanging, if you will, um, sort of blankly staring back at them when they ask us about these things. Of course, we've had conversation at the council table uh, about what is a farm and farm retail sales and where that is appropriate. So we can group that um, discussion as you had requested um, into this group of changes as well. So uh, those definitions that you see there, everything from apiary to outdoor storage need to be dealt with. 
And then we have some specific use regulations for full time farm worker housing, temporary farm worker housing and apiculture. So those are distinct things that it would benefit from having some regulations um, that guide people. If they're going to have these uses on the property, what things do they need to take into consideration? The next thing are accessory uses. So there are a number of definitions oh, contained. Oh, has a question, uh, Corey. Yeah. I beg your pardon. Sorry, I can't see you. I can only see my, there we go. I see your little picture. There we go. My little picture? Yes, sorry. It's hidden you know, behind my screen. picture is pretty little too, by the way. So uh, I, I could, if you could go back to the definition of uh, farm use and stuff like that. There you sure. go. And we uh, I, I, I'm thinking about an example in Lake Country here where someone's using hydroponics. I forget the title of, of aqua, whatever, aqua aquaculture. And then I'm also thinking that there's other variants of farming that are maybe more specific and niche that might be excluded if we don't put something in that definition that would include them. So I, I worry about what's not going to be allowed that should be as compared to what we have allowed and so could you just kind of speak to that a bit sure. and how we could sure fix that can. yeah yeah the growing of crops or the raising of livestock um growing these these are intended to be very broad definitions um not as uh, limited you know and getting down to the nitty-gritty certainly in uh, regulations, we may want to address those types of uses very specifically, but the definition of agriculture itself um, is intended to be this broader term. If we felt we needed to have that more specific information, most certainly a definition of aquaculture would accomplish that. And then we could decide if we wanted to have some general regulations that deal with that specifically. It's a pretty uncommon thing to occur in the interior of the province. Obviously, aquaculture along our coastlines uh, on the ocean, far more common. It's very unusual that one operation we do have here um, where he's doing a bit of an experimental thing. And you're absolutely correct. Maybe in that case, it would make sense for us to say, OK, if you're going to do these more specialized types of agriculture, whether it be aquaculture or um, uh, beekeeping, which is apiary or apiculture, we need to have specific regulations. So I, I would look to you for direction. If you'd like to go that way, we can certainly add some regulations in that regard. But that's the intent is to be a little more general and then funnel down into the more specific uses later. Well, I consider as a council, the fact that we know that exists, that maybe, maybe it would be pertinent for us to in, in include that. And uh, I, I appreciate, you know, the opportunity to talk about those kinds of definitions and uh, look forward to the rest of your presentation unless someone else has questions. Would um, would this be a place to and see if we could uh, change the um, ministry's mind on raising worms? Because uh, they keep saying that's not agricultural or beneficial to agriculture, and uh, yeah, and we we do have a worm farm here, and they not only sell the worms but they sell the castings to benefit <laughs> agriculture. But BC assessment and or or because the Ministry of Agriculture doesn't call it agriculture they can't get farm status and, uh, hmm. but, mr mayor i had not uh known that operation was in existence here or that that issue was one we can certainly look into that further um and that might be the kind of thing that we want to allow under that non-alr agriculture zone right recognizing it ourselves and saying okay this is what you're doing here are the things we're concerned about to eliminate uh, conflict with surrounding properties. Um, here's the things we yeah. want to discuss. Well, it is in ALR land, but it, it is. It mm -hmm. can't get assessed as uh, farm. 
because they don't consider raising worms farm practice and farming. Interesting. So see what happens. Very unusual. Yes. Castings are liquid gold, or not their gold. They yeah. Cost about the same as gold does. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, just something to look at. Any anything further, or I or Councillor McKenzie? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Corey. Yeah. So um, my uh, fellow councillor brings up uh, um, one that, uh, you know, um, fish farms is getting uh, um, cut back in this province big time, and they're talking about moving them onto um, land. land, and that would fall into this as well. So we, you know, if, if something like that wanted to move here, uh, we should make sure that we have something listed properly for that as well, because I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Blair's trout farm shows up here <laughs> at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and then he can use the net. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Councillor Reed. No. Um, thanks, Corey. Thanks for the presentation. I just have a couple of questions. Um, around um, some of the definitions. Um, the farm home plate is defined as one hectare, whereas um, so it, when you're looking at a full time farm worker, um, you have to have one hectare as your farm unit as a minimum. But when you're looking as a temporary farm worker, you have to have two hectares as a minimum. Just wondering what's the rationale behind those two changes? Why is it one hectare for a farm worker and two hectares minimum for a temporary farm worker? Um, the intent here, I think, is, is just to establish some difference in scale. Usually when you're talking about full time farm work or uh, farm worker, that's a single additional residence. When you're talking about temporary farm worker housing, you're talking about many additional temporary farm workers. And it is likely that you're also talking about not just a single piece of land. You're probably talking about a farm unit, one that involves a number of parcels of land. It where is. we have difficulty, this is this is where I have run into a, a bit of a challenge, is sometimes the most um, opportune places to put temporary farm worker housing are on smaller parcels where there is less impact on the overall farm operation and so we're, we're sort of betwixt and between trying to decide do we really want to direct them to parcels that aren't currently being farmed and sometimes there's an opportunity to do that on the smaller parcels because more of it is dedicated to residential use so it it, it it's not necessarily hard and fast that this is exactly why the, the split is there. It's just a place to start the conversation. OK, because, yeah, I, I mean, this is where I'd appreciate Penny, uh, Councillor Gamble's input is it seems to me the smaller the farm, the less likely you are to be able to afford a full time worker and need somebody to come in and just help on a casual basis. But this discriminates against that in exactly that way. But I don't know. and and. That would be my question. Um, my other questions just before I hand over the floor um, is um, the farm unit. Is it defined as being with all within Lake Country or is it a farm unit across the Okanagan? I don't uh, I don't believe I made that um, distinction. You could do that, but because our our Political boundaries, if you will, between municipalities are often not relevant to farm operations boundaries. It can be limiting um, for properties uh, and farmers that operate near the boundaries or the, the, the outskirts of any given municipality where they might cross, cross over from one to the other. So I'm hesitant because um, while we want to regulate um, farming and we don't want anything to be abused, we also want to support our farmers. And if you had one property in Kelowna and one property in Lake Country on opposite sides of an invisible line, should 
that matter to his operation or not? And that's that's a political question that you can I, certainly I, direct me on. I yeah. think to clarify in the zoning, we need to clarify. We can't leave it as unsaid either way. We need to be clear on what we're saying here because I think it's got a fundamental impact either way either on the farming community and on people who are live adjacent to the farming community. So the farm could be in Kelowna, but yeah. all the time we're working in den would be in Lake Country. Yes, it is entirely yeah. possible. I think we do need to, to make that clear. Um, okay. And also there's a definition of a caretaker dwelling, um, which is used um, in here um, as sort of being exempt from some of the requirements. But my understanding that why would a farm had a, have a caretaker dwelling as opposed to temporary for a full time worker. So therefore, we, I don't think we need the definition of a caretaker dwelling in relation to um, agricultural use. I think I'm um, sorry, I'm looking for it on my sheets here and I'm not seeing because I agree with you that a caretaker is usually a residence on like an industrial property or commercial property where they're it's yeah. not usually associated with a, uh, an agricultural um, property. It's attachment C2. C2. Line H. An accessory building shall not be used as a dwelling unless the accessory building is an accessory suite or a caretaker dwelling which complies with the regulation of this bylaw. And then it's repeated in I again as well. But if we're changing this, I don't think that should be there because you're covering okay. already in the full time worker. OK, that's fine. I'll, I'll make that note. Some of some of the regulations I pulled over and didn't change a lot of. So that sounds like one I'm not familiar with. So I suspect that it's probably that it's not ingrained in my my psyche yet. So I'll, okay. I'll look into that for sure. OK, OK, uh, Councillor Arnold. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to the point of the, the different sizes for uh, temporary and, and full time. Uh, I think there needs to be some sort of distinction there because I, I can 100% see why the small farm, the small property would have a full time person because there'd be one other person or a family member. But they probably could not afford to access the temporary farm worker program. There's a lot of red tape and there's a lot of things that have to be done. And to allow that on smaller properties is, uh, is problematic for the neighborhood. Right. I mean, right now we have a situation on Shanks Road where there's 40, 80, 220 foreign worker accommodations on Shanks Road. That little road, that that community has buses driving in and out of it on one of our worst, worst roads in the community. It's not making it any better. All around, well, for the 140 unit, they're driving all around the entire Okanagan. These people don't work in. That happens to be in Kelowna to that 140 unit one. Mm -hmm. So um, that leads me into the next part of, I think it's really important that we have the discussion about the boundaries because for sure our neighbors to the south are not going to, uh, in, they're going to make decisions based on what's best for their community, not what's best for the entire Okanagan, but what's best for their community. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, you can certainly see a scenario because we're so central where Lake Country becomes the hub of temporary farm workers who don't actually work in this community. And if you look at one of the farm operations that exists in Lake Country that has that 140 units out on Shanks Road as one of their own multiple areas that they have, they have over 1500 acres scattered from Armstrong to the south. So they're based in Lake Country. I'm not saying that they're doing this, but the potential would be there for them to have their workforce all live in Lake Country. Well, that's certainly detrimental to the community, but even more detrimental to the agricultural land that we're trying to preserve. You know, I mean, I, I would say that the um, units that he built on Shanks Road that might be agricultural land, but it's not. It's not farmable. So they've made the best of a. They put the accommodation where it's not hurting the agriculture, but those other two properties on Shanks Road, that's prime farming property where those units are. And uh, around you see it constantly where those units are on prime farm property. So 
I think that we really need to have that discussion about where these things end up. Okay. Anytime you cluster lots of people together, that's not ever going to be great for the community. Right. If you can spread people out around the community, then they tend to integrate more within the community. Yep. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, um, well said. Um, I just wanted to add one thing to that as well. Um, I was talking to our our uh, one of our bl new blueberry farmers out on Oyama Road there um, yesterday, and um, he actually has a property in Kelowna and is leasing out here. Um, and uh, he is also threw out another name that was doing the same thing. And I and I just find it, um, you know, in to add to. Councillor Ireland's comments is just there is a whole lot of people doing um, farm stuff back and forth in these communities. So we definitely do need to come up with something to address this because um, I'm not saying it's all bad, but it's definitely something there that uh, there is no invisible boundary when it comes to these farms buying up land in different communities. So it is something, it's definitely a mm -hmm needs to be talked about uh, a little bit more um, in order to come up with what works best here. Okay. Um, further, to, further to what uh, Councillor Aaron and Council McKenzie are saying, my mic's on. Um, my understanding, we're the only jurisdiction in Central Okanagan that doesn't prohibit uh, temporary farm workers working outside the community. So the other, uh, Kelowna said you have to work, their temporary farm workers have to be in, in the community and, and West Kelowna does as well. I'm not sure about Peachland, but uh, um, and uh, we don't have anything that says they, because there are owners that have land in Lake Country and in Kelowna and in West Kelowna, um, but all the temporary farm workers are here. And so I don't know how we can say that if there if you have temporary farm worker housing it has to be in the municipality that they work in okay other do it so we don't haven't done it yet. go ahead council mckenzie and yeah. <laughs> uh, just you know as we're talking about this this is obviously um keeps getting more information added to this i i, I wonder if we almost should uh do a little more gathering of what the actual uh, what we're dealing with here, because it seems like we're getting, um, you know, if we're going to make the decision right and make this thing proper the first time, we almost should know some numbers here. So I don't know if, um, you know, we just did our our egg uh, plan and came up with some numbers, but I wonder if uh, while that's fresh. Um, fresh uh freshly done there and the stats and numbers are still around i wonder if it's worthwhile us contacting them again and asking for a little more specific on this um, because uh i would hate to see us go ahead and do something here and then discover we have some unintended consequences here so yeah thank you mr mayor i might um I might just add that the only one of us that has farm experience who's not here right now, Councillor Gamble, yeah. has always spoken that we, we need to protect Lake Country's community and have our farm workers and our farm worker accommodation for farmers that work in Lake Country. Councillor Scarrow. Well, I don't actually disagree with Councillor Ireland, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but I, I kind of just, I'm thinking on the other side of the coin. Um, Temporary farm workers, I, I, I understand it would be wonderful if we could keep them working in Lake Country and only have temporary workers that are in Lake Country, but I have no idea and I can't envision a way of enforcing that. And and we could make it a rule and maybe 50% or 100% or something like that of the people would comply. But as far as enforcement goes, I see nothing but a big bucket to throw money in that probably wouldn't work. So. I liked Councillor McKenzie's idea of bringing in more data on this topic and finding out how many temporary workers we might be dealing with 
and whether there's an economic benefit to having them in our community, buying things out of our stores and servicing with our thing, whether there's a cultural benefit to seeing people of different races and nations integrated into our community, having our children experience that and and uh, and kind of living with more diversity within our culture. So yes, there's some definite negatives to grouping people, as Councillor Aaron has suggested, and for those people to be working without or outside of our jurisdiction. Eh? I, I don't know how we can control it, but I just think that more data would be important to hear and maybe include some of the possible or potential benefits that might be occurring because those people are here. Councillor Aaron. I just might uh, disagree. <laughs> disagree. <laughs> When you cluster people into small villages, they tend not to integrate into the community. Always happens. Also, I would say that, um, you know, yeah, I know I lost it now. Yeah. <laughs> lost, yeah. What was the second thing he said? I, I just know that half the people on my oh, bus are Jamaicans with real trees. <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're Haitian also, actually. But, and look at it, the integration, when that happens, that is a good thing. I don't disagree with that, but it doesn't happen when you cluster large groups of people together. Because they stay in their group together. Clustering, yeah. But also enforcement, I don't see that as a massive issue. I mean, there's not that many of them. So the rules are quite clear. They already have to sign off on these things and they have to make a statutory de declaration every year. So I think the enforcement part will is negligible compared to many of the other bylaws that we have. I appreciate your input. Uh, but it comes all comes back to uh, housing and temporary farm workers. We can't. We can't. Uh, we we used to operate in in the valley here and and in the Kootenays with migrant workers that moved from valley to valley to yeah, Dukabor. Dukabors are uh, um, native uh, indigenous people that uh, travel and, and from Washington, Oregon to BC, uh, uh, all over, but um, doesn't happen anymore. And it would, if we put too many restrictions on, on where people can work in terms of farm, temporary farm workers, it could be detrimental to the, the agriculture and to farming and difficult. So um, we don't want a lot of good agricultural land covered with temporary farm housing units. But um, and then and that's I think. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's that sort of is that good for the valley? But uh, I, I don't know. So we'd, uh, I, I think, uh, as Councilor McKenzie said, we need some data on just about uh, the contribution uh, of of labor, and and how we're going to house it uh, up and down the valley. A regional effort. A regional effort, indeed. Like from the two regional yeah. districts. Well, uh, you have to get all of the regional partners to agree. And that so two major people with most of the votes have already banned this. And they're yeah, the West Kelowna and Kelowna. Yeah, they control the support. Yeah, I know that. But uh, it, it's something that should be raised regionally, though, because yeah. it's it. We are one economic unit in that sense. But uh, anyway, so what we could do, or we're limited to what we can yeah. We're limited to what we could do because we can ban it. Period. Just like they have, and just like everyone else has, right? I don't think that solves anything, and I don't think it changes a heck of a lot. But but working through the regional district to say to all of those communities that have the power that Councillor Ireland talks about, that it doesn't make sense for all of us to ban it because it's not happening anyway. So let's not let's all do the same thing, but let's change what we what we do. And the only way to do that is through the regional district. Well, but that's just this guy's opinion. It it might it might be a strategy, and that it might get the federal government and the provincial government to get their agricultural uh, departments to come. Or with. by banning it, it might force the other players to come to the table. That's yeah. another thing. 
Right? That's what I mean. lockstep with them saying, well, you guys have done it, we're doing it. See how and, your farmers talk to you. Yeah, no. And the other the other players I to the table. I agree originally if everybody plays together in the sandbox, it's nice. Yeah, but that doesn't happen a lot. The other players are the province and the feds because they, they subsidize the uh, uh, farm worker uh, in, in and out of the country with uh, uh, to a large extent. So uh, the foreign workers particularly. So it, it but. So I'm just thinking in terms of timing, because I know this brought this bylaw is broken down into a number of sections and we seem to be talking about the first part of um, it, which is attachment B, which is all about the temporary fallen workers. And yeah. Corey is also brought to the table in this section of the presentation, attachment C, which starts to talk about, or attachment B, sorry, that starts to talk about um, accessory buildings and agricultural yeah. use definitions. So do we need to maybe give some clarity for Corey on where we want these two se very separate pieces to go? Um, it sounds like there needs to be more work on that first part, the first um, section, which is attachment A, which is talking about the farm plate and the seasonal accommodation um and full-time worker housing mm -hmm. um and b does too though. and b does too but c which is talking about the definitions of agriculture how um by and large remains unchanged with some clarification so maybe we could move i don't know whether it makes sense to move everything on the same track um and hold a b and c back or does it make sense to hold a and B back for further investigation along the lines of this conversation and allow C to move forward. Um, it's a question really also from Corey's side of things, which would make it easy for her. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, certainly, it. I think it would be helpful. We've got that one set of bylaws that you gave first reading to sitting waiting for a next group before we send them out. So it'd be great to maybe move some of this if you have some that you're comfortable with move them forward and then i can continue to do some additional research um talk with our consultant find out if we've got some stats or if there's a way we can figure out some of these things i know there had been a, a discussion at the regional planning table a number of years ago um from the from the planners perspective we all got together and talked about these issues um, so I'll go back to that group and see if I can glean some additional information for you but yes if there is anything that you're happy to proceed with and I haven't concluded my presentation but certainly you know this was the first sort of group um, then I'm happy to do it whichever way you like okay anybody want to we can do the um, uh, as councillor reed suggested uh, go to c for the bylaw corey have you finished your presentation on attachment a which is the summary of agricultural and residential use and attachment c which is the accessory in agricultural use is there more slides on those two um i had more on accessory but um we want if we heard that and then maybe made a decision and then we could leave sure. then we would break and then have the summary of a tourist accommodation uses because that's a bigger piece as well okay sure we can do that if everybody's happy just <laughs> no, I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to step on anybody's toes, but just, yeah, if we could get to the end of accessory and agriculture use, then we can make a decision on those two, and then that leaves us the second two to talk about. No. Yeah, no, I <laughs> totally agree. Uh, that, um, we do it. <laughs> uh, all right, you're good with that, uh, Corey? Yeah, I'm, I'm good, yep. Yeah. Sounds good. Oh, we have someone else's presentation out there now. There we go. OK. So accessory uses. Yes, we want to essentially simplify it 
right? We have three definitions, one for a building, one for a structure, and then this ancillary use, which has a whole other meaning in many other contexts. So I'm proposing we simplify it down to a single definition of accessory, which can apply to a use, a building, or a structure. No need for each of those to be different. And essentially, that should simplify things. It also frees up the word ancillary for us to use it in the more common way um, that it is currently through the liquor control and uh, cannabis regulation uh, legislation uses that word in a different way, which we probably will want to use when we talk about food and beverage. So anyway, that's that was the one of the main points there. And then um, as soon as we talk about agriculture, we sort of start to cross this blurry line between agriculture and accommodation uses. Um, so this is why we brought these two groups forward together. Um, agritourism, obviously, very distinctly something that happens in an agricultural area, um, but tourist accommodation is very similar in a lot of ways, particularly if we simplify the definition and move regulations to a separate section. We've also recently had a lot of trouble with this definition, apartment hotels. Is it an apartment or is it a hotel? Or is it a hotel that looks like an apartment but acts like a motel? You know, like it, there's just too many things. So again, uh, with, the, with the concept of simplifying and recognizing that when you um, have specific circumstances that might require different regulations, you can establish those regulations, but that agritourism accommodation would be temporary accommodation subject um, to the specific use regulations contained in the bylaw, which seems a bit of a circular reference. But what it means is that you could change those regulations without having to revisit the definition each time. It also um, allows it to be dealt with in one area. Um, so you don't have to look in six different places for all of the various pieces, which that's uh, similarly what uh, tourist accommodation, meaning the commercial rent of accommodation to transient travelers for periods not exceeding 20, uh, 240 days in any calendar year for any particular guest, uh, which includes a building with an office for check-in and registration and includes campgrounds. Now, I think we, we talked a little bit at one of our previous meetings that maybe we want to um, distinguish even more so um, we could, in fact, take campgrounds out and make that something different. But essentially, it is tourist accommodation. It's just, again, getting back to the form of the, I guess, the development. It's not a building necessarily. Tourist accommodation will, will usually take case, uh, place in a building, but it could take place on a site where it was a campground. Tourists are being accommodated in each case. Um, and we could certainly then talk about the difference between tourist accommodation regulations and campground accommodations, for, for example. Councillor Reid had a question. Sure. Sorry, Corey, I think we're going no. over into attachment E um, oh. because that's tourist accommodation and use. So I was just wondering if we could deal with A and C, which is the first two that you presented on. And sure. then yeah. I was, this will take us into another whole conversation, I think. OK, then... yeah, I was I was trying to show where that where the line blurs between one into the other. So yeah, happy to but, stop but, there. Yeah, but yeah. attachment C doesn't have anything, just deals with accessory and agricultural use and has its own separate bylaw that we're considering. Right. Then yes. Attachment E and opens up. Sure. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Is at the end of that. But yes, yes, absolutely. So, I say too quickly, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, not at all, not at all. I'm just, yeah. Um, for mm. me, I would be happy to move attachment D, which is talking about purely the accessory and agricultural use going to the yeah. next stage. But it sounds yeah. like there's a lot of conversation that needs to happen around A, which is agricultural and residential use definitions. Okay, okay so 
So we uh, can talk about bylaw 1149, waiting for some additional information and clarification, um, seeing what we can find in terms of statistics that might support that. But bylaw 1150, um, which is attachment D, you'd be happy to proceed to next step. Okay. Uh, Councillor uh, Ireland. Yeah, I was just going to second that that motion. I uh, I agree 100% with the yeah. sending it back for more information, but let's get this one done. Perfect. I okay. appreciate that. Any, Any further question? discussion on attachment C? Hearing none, those in favor? The bylaw is first reading. Uh, that yes. uh, first reading. Okay. Anything more? Yes. Unless you wanted to take a break now, because as I say, I segued fairly quickly there. Um, we do have. Attachment E is the farm worker housing, unless I have an older copy of it. Was dinner happening? Attachment E is tourist accommodation. Used tourist. Oh, OK, I've got the old version with my sticky notes on it. So, OK. Sorry, I've repackaged this so many times. I'm having a hard time keeping up. Well, dinner is coming. Why don't we take a short break and then we'll yeah, drink? Yeah, I did. Nobody's very hungry, are they? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know dinner was being ordered. Was Small dinner time. ordered? I didn't know. Oh wow! Okay. Small we're, <laughs> pardon? Yeah. Um, we're going to take a break, Corey. And okay. Do dinner. Okay, and that's we'll fine. Come back to attachment B. Yeah. Okay. Perfect timing. Okay. Good, good. It's almost like we, we find it or something. Yeah, I, I thought okay, we were, were going to get done by 6 30. I need to borrow you. Oh, <laughs> this is not yet nothing to do with what we're talking about. Then you just get short on it. Oh, sorry. That's okay. No, no, you do what you need to do. I just wanted your opinion because these guys are. Oh, yeah. Ones we use are no longer available. Oh yeah, there's another. There's a link. Hey, lover, how are you? Oh, okay. And you get your food because this is going longer. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. There's curry in the freezer. Okay, okay, my love. Take care. Bye.
cap rate on that property is like
Australia was a pretty bad place to be if you're an Aboriginal person. You available at three on Thursday?
Hi, Corey, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> okay, I believe council's wondering if you would mind continuing while they not at us all. Along. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that'd be fine. And you know what I did for everyone's information? I changed things up and went back to the attachments. Perhaps if we work through the attachments, that might be an easier way than looking at PowerPoint. So I believe that we've looked at attachment A and B. We've discussed attachment C. But I think you would like to have some more conversation about this before we proceed. Is that is that correct? No, that one's no, good. One that one's good. So yes. attachment C and D are good. Which was 1150. OK, that makes sense. Sorry, I was. I had so many papers flying around my room here. I thought, OK, yes. try it again. OK, so I have to open another attachment. Oh, C and D are the same. Let's go here. All right. That's where it's confusing. This puts us on to attachment E. Is that correct? <laughs> All right. Tourist accommodation. So as I said previously, um, agritourism sort of crosses the line between agriculture uses and uh, tourist accommodation uses. So um, this particular attachment deals with both. And you can see how I've taken the details out of the definition, uh, simplified the definition, and then outlined uh, the regulations uh, uh, which will appear under specific use regulations. Similarly, tourist accommodation um, comes to replace, as I had mentioned in on the PowerPoint, uh, was a little easier to see in this regard because we carry over the page here. Um, but tourist accommodation handles some of those unusual uses like apartment hotel. Then we move on to um, bed and breakfast. And again, bed and breakfast homes um, is probably one of the better definitions and uh, regulation situations within our bylaw. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I have uh, refashioned it uh, to refer in the definition to the specific use regulations contained in the bylaw and then got far more um, specific in the specific use regulations um, proposed. Uh, then we go, because these are um, in the order they appear in the bylaw, so we go back to accommodation types and I'm suggesting using, rather than talking about the type of building it is, um, going to uh, tourist accommodation, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it could happen in a building in in, in many cases or on a site uh, when it comes to a campground. There is a definition of campground and uh, that's freestanding um, definition, uh, which doesn't really impact the definition uh, proposed for tourist accommodation, just a little more specific in speaking to that type of use. Then, of course, we have uh, short term vacation rentals, another type of accommodation. I really in this um, set of proposals didn't make any changes to the existing regulations in the bylaw, recognizing that um, you had gone through them with Jamie not all that long ago, at least not long ago in the life of this particular bylaw. Um, so I didn't envision changing that a whole lot. I believe our discussion at one of our previous meetings might suggest that um, you would like to revisit some portions of that, um, but most most definitely you can you can instruct me in that way, but I, I try to basically just again move uh, the the details from the definition as it stands now, simplifying the definition, moving them to regulations. So um, the content uh, should should pretty much be the same. 
seemed to be a little bit of misunderstanding about the distinction between um, those uses as they exist in the bylaw now. And, and so, as I say, happy to take your instruction. Um, leaving the definition of a sleeping unit because um, uh, it, it gives a little more information um, and it sort of applies to it more to a use than to a, a building type. So again, tourist cabin, uh, something uh, that appears, I think, in one zone in our in our entire bylaw, uh, probably appropriate to go back to the tourist accommodation definition and introduce regulations that deal um, more specifically with these uh, size limitations because those those can be handled in regulations and I would capture those when uh, we dealt with the individual individual zones themselves. So uh, another type of uh, ex, uh, pardon me, accommodation use is uh, boarding and lodging houses. Simplify this a bit to talk about what it, who a boarder is and what boarding use means and then uh, provide some some regulations. So um, one of to uh, avoid any confusion about the definition of boarding and lodging between that and a, a care facility use because you can see that congregate housing uh, was language that was previously used but it's no longer used in that context any longer so it's appropriate for us to um, remove that language and, and stick specifically with the boarding use so i believe that is um, the bulk of attachment E, and then of course attachment F is bylaw 1151 um, that summarizes that information um, in bylaw form. And uh, so perhaps you'd like to have um, some additional conversation about this. I've been taking notes all the while along here, so I had papers flying all over the place. So i am got my pen at the ready and I'm happy to hear your comments. Thank you. Thanks, Corey, for the presentation. Um, this one is probably the one where I've got the most comments on um, and I will try and get through them as quickly as possible. Um, I suppose my confusion is lying from um, the difference between agritourism accommodation and tourist accommodation. Um, I referring back to the DC 13 zoning that was presented to Council on the 15th of June, where it was specifically mentioned that that DC report to council picked up on some of the changes that we are addressing here. Yes. So in the zone B on that proposal, it covered 10 units of agricultural tour accommodation and tourist accommodation. So my confusion is how can we blend agritourism accommodation and tourist accommodation on an agricultural property? I can understand if those two things are for separate zones, but we seem to be using them as being applicable to A1 zoning. Mm -hmm. um, and agritourism has a limit of 10% of the total lot area. So again, are we talking the farm or are we talking the lot? It doesn't take into account any other developments that have been happening on that area. So if I go and use that as other previous uh, application as an example, Area B is 26,000 square metres, which mm -hmm. sounds a lot, it's 2.6 hectares, but already 13,000 of that has been developed with the conference centre, the winery. So it's not, it, it, but it's using agritourism and tourist accommodation within that area. So my concern is that this is kind of blending two things together and not only from the sense of the ag protecting, protecting our agricultural environment, but also allowing the community to understand what could be built next to them. What can they expect if they move into this area or there's a farm next to them? And I, I'm, getting, I'm getting mixed messages about what is the potential here. And I think that's partly because the definitions are now to me, becoming too general and can be applied in every zone, which wasn't my understanding as well from where we were coming from. There was very, very specific tourist accommodation zones and they were zoned accordingly. Mm -hmm. And there was agricultural zoning, which is why we created the TA T1 
the A1TA zone specifically mm -hmm. to deal with that. Yet we've got something here that is already being blended and applied to an agricultural zone. So confused a little on that one. OK, um, I think I can probably address that. I, that may have been my oversight in creating area B because I was trying to look at, OK, what are they doing now? Because there is some agritourism existing um, on that property. And so trying to sort of blend from one to the other, perhaps, I'm certainly happy to go back and have a look at that more specifically. I can address the fact that agritourism accommodation was something that was imagined by the Agricultural Land Commission. When the Agricultural Land Commission decided that farmers could have up to 10 units of accommodation on their land to augment their farm income, if you will, that's when um, the definition of agritourism started to come into common usage. And so, uh, yes, it was envisioned mainly for just properties that were within the agricultural land reserve. Now, the properties that you're speaking of where we're talking about the DC 13 zone, those properties are not located within the agricultural land reserve. And as such, would likely in uh, some future sense probably be A2 rather than A1 because they would be agriculture not within the agricultural land reserve and it might be appropriate then to to decide exactly do we want to use the same framework as we use on the agricultural land or do we want to use the framework that we use on the looking at it from a commercial use perspective so um, I, I think I can take your comments and uh, reconsider uh, the information and, and see if I can provide some additional clarity for sure. Happy to do that. Trying to be trying to uh, um, deal with a whole bunch of things all at once is it is pretty complicated. Yeah. OK, um, I would I would just say that when the Agri Agriculture Land Commission um, moved for the agritourism, they did actually put a a limit per hectare, which yeah. we are removing here. So it had a maximum of 10 units on a 10 hectare lot. So they said if you have one hectare, you can have one agricultural unit, two hectares, two. And that is not something that we are doing here. So um, and to, to, and I think we've we, we used to have that. That was in our existing zoning is that it's per 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 hectare not per lot and we have the same discussion as we've had previously um, with other files about saying well what is a lot sometimes a lot is handily defined as the lot and other times it can be more advantageous to the applicant to define it as a farm so again we, we're quite fluid in our acceptance of what a lot is depending on what the application is and I don't know whether that's always the best decision to make and and the final comment about area b is if it is being developed to the state, state where over 50% of it is uh, built environments, which are in some cases not related to agriculture, then I would question whether it is an agricultural zone for that portion. Um, and that's maybe a discussion that we need to have at a later date. So I would kind of like to discuss this in the context of where we are now than and what it means to the community now, rather than maybe looking at it in terms of what do we, zoning do we need to change later on down the line? So, OK, um, I would just mention that regardless of what our zoning bylaw says, the Agricultural Land Commission Act is going to continue to apply. Um, so we need to be mindful of that, and that's why I'm suggesting that in time we might want to have two different agriculture zones, one within, one with the outside of. I appreciate what you're talking about. I think the area B of the DC 13 zone is a separate conversation. Um, the definitions of agritourism and tourist accommodation are broader and certainly um, uh, their definitions that I've worked with previously long before um, I, I knew of the DC 13 zone or the application in that regard. So um, I can assure you that um, what I've put forward to you is not, uh, I would have put this forward to you whether there were, that other application had existed or not. Um, this is uh, consistent with um, 
you know, other other places and uh, previous usage of these terms. So let's let's leave that. Absolutely, I agree with you. Let's leave that uh, DC 13 conversation out of it and let's look specifically at um, agritourism and tourist accommodation and and you can give me your direction on that. OK, and my final comment is that I would like to protect agricultural land, regardless of whether it's in the ALC or not. And I think we're not going to get new things added into the ALC to protect the agricultural land. So therefore, it's down to our bylaws to protect the agricultural land that we do have left outside of the ALC in the community. And that's where I would look to see this bylaw be very clear on whether it applies in agriculture to the agricultural A1 zoning would be only the tourist agritourism and then tourist accommodation can sit in the commercial zone. OK. Good. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would agree with the comments made by Councillor Reid there, uh, but I might go so far as to say that perhaps agricultural tourism doesn't fit into this box as a whole and agricultural tourism needs to be on its own and there's a lot of problems going forward there i mean uh the alc has got their rules um but uh you know there was discussion at one alc i'm meaning that, that the whole agricultural tourism thing is, is a failure it, it's a complete failure it's not serving the community it, well, it, it's serving the farmers in a way, but what's happened if you go to some of the properties on Yama, they've turned into permanent trailer parks. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, that would require us to try to go and enforce the rules on how long people are staying, which is problematic to begin with. It's similar to the short-term housing issue. Um, you know, if, if you look around the community at what are supposed to be campgrounds, there's really only one that that a person can drive into and stay because the other really big one in Oyama has all permanent accommodation. Um, those things never move. They have buildings built onto them. I, I don't really see how it can be like that, but anyways, it's not part of this discussion. So I think that, that agriculture tourism needs to be in its own kettle of fish and not mixed into the rest of tourist accommodation. Um, on top of that, I certainly would like to see us have more discussion about short-term rental accommodation because as has been expressed at our other meetings, whilst hard to manage, it's becoming one of our community's biggest problems. It's, it's the reason why people, a lot of people in this community don't want to live here. They don't like the district because they think that we can actually manage this problem, which we haven't been able to do uh, to no fault of our own really, but because it's a difficult problem to manage. But it's becoming it's becoming worse and worse as days go on. So we we really need to revisit this and see what else we can do. And you know some of the ideas that have been brought forth of of having a contractor come in to help out. Um, you know the the numerous you know we all talk about Airbnb. Let's just not forget that Airbnb is one monster on its own. There's VRBO. There's tons of tiny little rental accommodation units run out of somebody's backyard or their basement. There's Owner Direct, which is, you know, it's kind of my fault because Owner Direct is a company that originated at Big White and has spread out all over the world. I know. <laughs> I feel bad. I'd like to go back and shoot the guy, but yeah. uh, they, they do a lot of good, but they also do a lot of bad and they don't have the same ethics and they don't have the same rules that Airbnb does. And they don't, they don't have that answering back to communities. And I mean, there's a lot of problems there that we need to work through. So I think we need to revisit that. And I, I, I'd like to see tourist accommodation out of there. Out of, I'd like to see agricultural tourism out of the tourist accommodation back in, in, in its own place. Maybe it goes back into a, the agricultural bucket to make it easier. I don't know. Well, uh, I agree with that uh, 100%. I agree with my. Uh, um, uh, Cara's comments as well um, and I was going to mention that that that's one thing that uh, we're seeing more and more of is these um, long-term uh, camping spots turn into all year long and um, uh, you know it's something there that um, you know it's not really a bylaw conversation but at the same time if we're going to be doing this we got to figure 
how to deal with that problem because uh you know i see the same thing you go by there and they've got these uh trailers that have um structures built around them and you don't build a structure if you're staying there 30 days or less so it's definitely an issue and i and i, and I do think it should be separated as well so um i'll uh leave it at that thank you your worship um so a couple of comments uh i find it intriguing the thought of having an a1 a2 zone and separating lands within and lands without with agriculture my concern i share with councillor reed is to protect agriculture and to protect agriculture both outside of it and inside of the alc lands so corey i guess what we're saying is if you chose to present to us those options to do that that the a2 zone the newly created zone would have to protect farmland and farming practices and if we could separate them and if that would be an advantage to the process that we're going through with development day eh, then i would be interested in learning about that i'm open to that i think uh, the other parts of it with tourist accommodation I uh, I would like to see what that would look like separated from uh, farming activities. Eh? I believe that Councillor Ireland has a very strong point there that it is mostly commercial and uh, and should be treated differently and should be restricted in some cases. Eh? And I think the only way to do that, we can do it as, it, as you have presented it within the uh, agricultural bucket, so to speak. Eh? but that there is confusions there and there's cross references and things and maybe if we separated it and put it in a different separate place all by itself that might be clear clarification those are my comments okay thank you mr okay. mayor may i make a quick comment yes please do um with respect to this concept of uh, two different agriculture zones, um, one thing I would remind Council of is in the zone, the agriculture zone that is not within the agricultural land reserve, you actually have more ability. Because remember how the Agricultural Land Commission Act works. It says you can regulate these things, but you can't regulate these things. So agriculture land that is outside of the reserve, we actually can do some things that we can't do where land was, is within the reserve. So um, don't think of it as giving something up. In fact, there's some benefit um, because there are things that you can do there that you won't be able to do within the reserve, just by the nature of the provincial legislation. Can you clarify yeah. that for me and put forward an example? Sure, some of the things, the Agricultural Land Commission Act is an unwieldy piece of legislation, but it says you can, you can allow these things, you can prohibit these things, but you cannot prohibit these other third category of things. You can't prohibit those within the reserve. You have to let farmers do it. But for agriculture land that's not within the reserve, you have more um, freedom because you're not constrained by that act. So I have seen municipalities be more restrictive. So they would say, no, you can't have agritourism accommodation on these ALR lands or on these agricultural lands that are not within the reserve because we can say we prohibit that. We, we're not bound by the act. So it, it, when we when we have a more fulsome discussion of this I'll I'll try to bring back some very specific examples for you so that you, you see um, the benefit because there is you know it's a it's like any double-edged sword right there's good and there's bad but I I'd like to discourage you from thinking you would lose the ability you in fact would gain some ability um, thanks for your clarification no problem Except it's up to a council, and a council might decide that they absolutely, uh, yeah, they can um, do other things on that on a one land. Uh, it's up to council to zone it a one. Yeah, um, or but um, I I totally agree with Councillor Ireland. The agritourism has failed. It it, it agritourism as a concept 
started in New York, uh, where people in New York apartment buildings would vacation to rural uh, New York State and work on a farm free for, uh, I mean, no, no labor, but learn what it took to pick your own apples or pears or cherries or whatever. And you might get bored, but you, uh, I mean, room, and not room, but you'd get food uh, for your work and you would learn all about farming. And, that, and it was kind of like a, 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 an agricultural vacation out of New York. And California is doing the same. But um, California has a population of Canada uh, and a lot of people don't get to see farms or be on a farm and so they went there. But when the government dropped it on us with no, and they didn't have any, how many uh, accommodations you could put on how many hectares or anything. And before we had any bylaws to control anything that there was 10 units on two acres on Greenhill Road or whatever with campfires and people's uh, bedroom windows sort of. So it, it was really uh, not what New York State and California were doing. And, and so, uh, but they didn't, so I, I think they should scrap and we're dealing with one now that is a real issue that uh, it got in somehow when it didn't even have farm status and uh, um, you had to have at least I think had farm status oh, yeah. to be able to put some things on what you said. Um, but uh, I don't it it's it's not working and and I know some places that were working farms that were able to put on 10 or 15 pads and now they're not farming. They got the revenue of however much for a trailer pad annually and that um, is certainly not what agritourism was supposed to be. So I think they should scrap it and I don't know if they ever will, but that's the only way you only get that um, full-time orcharding back is uh, uh, that are now full-time campsites. So, but I, I don't know that we're going to do it with our bylaw. <laughs> we, I, I don't no, see how we can. But it, it's something we should be arguing with. Uh, to to try to preserve agricultural land, um, scrap the agritourism, because it's not agritourism, it's uh, campground. But anyway. Carry on, Corey. We're going to get something done here on which which one are we on now? Well, um, I think we got to attachment F, so we're looking at bylaw 1151 and you're suggesting you'd like me to take agritourism accommodation, move it back uh, to the other agriculture bylaw, which was 1149. And um, so I can rearrange some of these things and uh, I guess what I need is a little bit of direction uh, because I had not uh, envisioned uh, changing the regulations with respect to short-term rental uh, or short-term vacation rental. Um, maybe you can give me some idea of how much work you'd like us to do on that before I uh, repackage that and, and bring that back to you. That's Councillor Ireland has a I, question, comment. I don't see that we should be jumping into making some changes right now. I think we we really need to have a fulsome discussion just about this topic. And um, you know, we we need to look at what what other places are doing that are having that problem. Um, you know, Tofino seemed to attack this in a big way and seemed to be re relatively successful. Why aren't we? Why can't we be successful? Right, which sure, we don't want to eliminate it. Yeah. No. We, we've got to, well, shouldn't say that <laughs> yeah, yeah. at this point, but I could always turn my rental suite where I rent to somebody for a low price plan monthly um, into a, one of those. No, there's, there's lots of solutions out there, uh, and I think you need to have a look at what those solutions are. So I, I just think that we need to have that discussion. Okay. Unless there's uh, other councillors that feel like they have the answers right now, because I certainly don't. No. 
<clears throat> I surely don't. Maybe Raina does. <laughs> no, uh, she's dealing with the problems that we have with this. Yeah. That, uh, Raina's got uh, the big catcher middle. <laughs> yeah, but it's like this so, size. Uh, it's uh, it's really difficult, Corey. I, and I, I, where where do you want to go with it? Council, I mean. Oh, go ahead. The first off. The goal was to prevent people from buying houses and turning them into rental yeah. properties by rather than you know renting to a family okay great but turning into short-term rental properties and making a fortune off of buying that house and not using it like that the overcrowding of the units right like we say there's 40 units well in most of the places in my neighborhood there's, you know, there's groups of 16 to 20 people in these houses. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, enforcement is really difficult. So we've got to be quite stringent with the rules so that we can allow enforcement to happen. And maybe, you know, the way to attack it is maybe the online presence. I mean, you know, Air Airbnb does try to follow the rules. Does VRBO? I don't know. Does you know the other the other accommodation playful? Definitely not. Right? And if somebody can just make an attack, you know, a yes. Kijiji ad and Kijiji, do it that way, yeah. it's impossible. But you know, back when this first entered the admissible thing three or four years ago, they already had the ability to track these kind of things. These consultants had the ability to track that kind of advertising online. It's obviously gonna cost money. So nothing cheap, but there's got to be ways to at least take a bite out of it. So, I mean, those are those are a couple of things okay. along that line. Mm -hmm. Somebody else help me out here. Yeah, <laughs> we all feel the same way, but we've got to be other solutions. Uh, well, it, it it's a problem, and and but uh, the solution uh, I think is. Uh, I'm not sure that we can craft a bylaw that would uh, make people behave better. I don't know <laughs> how, how we do that. We try to do it by keeping the time down and the number of people involved down and the owner has to be responsible and be there. Uh, none of that ever happens. Right. None of that happens. And yeah. the owner doesn't have to be there. No. So that, that's, I think, a fault in our bylaws. Yeah. All they have to do is prove that they own the place. Yeah. And that they're claiming the uh, homeowner subsidy. Well, I have, I have two properties. I mean, I could go and lie and say that my house is at Big White is my principal residence mm -hmm. and rent it out. And here, here you go. But so that rule isn't substantial enough. People aren't there to minute to the whole idea was that there's a host and that host looks yeah. after the property and but, the neighborhood. But we have no host. We have property. no host. I mean, people just up and leave and rent their house out. And there's parking issues, there's garbage issues, the party issues. You know, we don't have by law at 10 o'clock at night. And last I heard again, and I, I haven't talked to, uh, to uh, the CAO about this, but the police are refusing phone calls on on matters in Okanagan Center. They've refused to come. That's a city issue. That's a bylaw issue. We're not coming. Hmm. So, yeah, I've had five phone calls. And look at it. It's not the local police, but it's whoever's answering that damn phone in Kelowna. This has happened multiple times. You know, even to the point of, you know, a few years ago when a guy was getting stabbed, we said, well, it's it's not our problem. <laughs> It's a bylaw issue. Now, you know, we would never send a bylaw officer into an area where there's going to be any harm because he's not equipped to deal with that. Or she. He or she, sorry. Councillor Reed. Um, I think the point about people being on the property is a really valuable one. I think there are uh, people in the area who do operate very well behaved, well mannered mm -hmm. Airbnbs or VRBOs or Fukijiji or however. 
um, and you know bring people to the community and share with them local information about local restaurants and places to visit. Um, so I think it's one of those situations where it's a big it's it's a big pot, but not necessarily everything in the pot is bad. Um, no. And no. maybe we need to, you know, I mean, one of the things I think Corey's already mentioned it, and Council Arden already mentioned it, um, other areas have dealt with this successfully. Um, and I do feel we need to reach out to them and see how have they how have they created this? Because we don't want they, you know, there are good things about it. Um, and equally, there are unmanageable things. And I speak as a person who's had this and it's like you get people who are horrible. Everything looks right on paper. They come in and they just ruin the place for the right. neighbors and for everybody else. So and I've experienced that and it's and it's not a good place that you want to be. You don't your neighbors don't want to be there. You certainly don't want to be there. Um, but these guests are long gone and they don't care. So um, I think there are things that we need to maybe tighten up on in terms of of that supervision side of things. And maybe they need to be smaller um, and maybe they need to be hosted um, and that's a requirement and it has to come through a separate zoning. I mean, we have a separate zoning for TA to, uh, for tourist accommodation mm -hmm. or agri-tourism accommodation. Maybe that's how we need to manage it through a temporary use permit or something like that, that actually allows the neighbors to have a say on what goes on in their community. And there are certain processes in place and, and to be honest, pulling towing the line and saying if you don't do this we're not going to have a conversation about this we've we we do a piece on education we say this is what's out there everybody's aware of it it'll be on castanet or we are all over the news therefore if you did not do this you know the rules and you're not abiding by it so let's just say here's the notice you know because our bylaw team are super super busy and we don't need to necessarily do a whole amount of education and support on every single infraction. Maybe this comes down to a, here's your ticket. Quick and dirty. Yeah, well, or simple and effective. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and taking, you know, doing a piece of education, tidying up the bylaw, doing the education piece, and then saying, okay, this is it. These so are the how rules. do you stop them from advertising? Well, you you tick it. You just basically, and maybe it's a consultant, and maybe we have our IT guys come in, and you can pull the stuff off <laughs> Airbnb and Kijiji and Castanet pretty quickly. Yeah, and you've but got if they're operating. You can ticket them. Yeah. Marina, you want to clue them in? <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a little bit of information, but um. Uh, Ruth has definitely pulled a bunch of information only from Airbnb, but we're working on gathering that and then we're going to cross compare it to uh, she she got some sort of program that can get into the back end where we can get their address. Um, we can compare that to our homeowner grant so we can try and tie them to that, but it's only Airbnb. Like you said, they could be anywhere, um, but but it's definitely I think Councillor Reed's idea about the temporary use permit idea that's an interesting concept that I because I agree they're going to be tough we're going to be door knocking we're going to be in there counting rooms if we if they let us in if they don't then we'll count windows but you know um yeah, but we do it. try and get the information try and cross reference and absolutely that's our plan as soon as I get my officers in here to attack and yeah. we will be ticketing for sure I mean I think that if you can if you can accomplish some of it by a, from a desk it's going to be a whole lot more effective than trying to go and knock on doors. But the problem is, some of them see it as a cost of doing business. Pay a ticket. Pay a ticket. Pay a ticket. Yeah, but every day, right? Maybe I we'll see. Well, Raina, you got the you sent an email around. Yeah. yeah. And then so. the ones who are operating legitimately and, I mean, and doing a great practice. job and keeping everything above board. They'll get the business. So I know, and I think that's right. If you're doing everything and being a good neighbor and providing a service to, in the community that gets tourists out and visiting local restaurants and things like that, fantastic. Because we don't have a ho big hotel. So yeah, then they are necessary in some way or form. But, but they shouldn't you know, be shouldn't be advertised as the only bedrooms we have are B and B. Uh, we should should have some. Tourist accommodation that, um, like, like we used to have, but motels got, um, or not, you know, the campgrounds and all these things have permit yeah. trailers in them. Yeah. 
So when you, when you come to this community, you can't do that. Yeah. What are you going to do? We're losing off spot. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, where are we with this one? It must be on split H. Oh, yeah. Corey, you got more? Uh, there are two more attachments for us to go through, yes. Yep. Do we want to do something do with this one? we have enough one? there too? Yeah. Do we have enough? I've made lots of notes, okay. so. so yeah. Do we want to see this one come back to us? Or are we happy? To, if we move agritourism into the first one, into A with agricultural and recreational use, which will come back to council, yeah. and short term accommodation rentals is taken out and dealt with as a separate issue, then are we? could we move this one to go to the next stage? I don't see why not. Those are the two outstanding yeah, two, issues. Two issues. Well, I would move that then. Okay, move. And second, second. sure. And any we're moving short term rentals and agritourism okay. accommodation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Dealing with those separately. Okay. Those in favor? Yeah. Uh, uh, Raina? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just for clarification, so we're moving just agritourism to 1149. We're taking mm -hmm. out short term vacation rentals to be dealt with separately as its own entity. And then giving a reading to 1151 to first reading with with those yeah. amendments. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Those in favor? Oh, motion carries. Good. Good. You getting warmed up though over there, Jeremy? Get warmed up. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. No, I had a long day of your own. Okay. It's so humid now. Oh. And, and then we're twenty four years with all of this. Let's create more units. Let's play it four hundred degrees. You good with the others? Where are we? Uh, well, the last one. Attachment G. Yeah. yeah. Attachment G. So the main focus of this set of post amendments is, of course, simplification of de uh, definitions and a shift to. Um, a more general reference to assembly uses uh, without so much consideration of why people are gathered. Regardless of who or why the people are gathered, assembly uses have the same impact um, with respect to in intensity of the use and the facilities required to serve the needs of those gathered, such as washrooms, parking, etc. So for that reason, the building code refers to assembly uses. And in the similar way, um, we can do the same in a zoning bylaw um, and, and be less uh, concerned about whether, you know, for what purpose they're gathered um, and then just deal with those things that might cause issues um, for uh, surrounding property owners. So as I mentioned, the amount of space that's provided, uh, washrooms, parking, etc. Those are the common things that you, you think about. And then that leaves aside the whole question of um, liquor licensing as well. So, for example, a food primary establishment uh, talks about what it's a restaurant essentially. Um, it may or may not be licensed under the Liquor Control and Licensee Act, and a liquor primary establishment is distinguished. So, it's a restaurant that focuses on alcoholic beverage service. So, some of this we're sort of dancing between uh, the uh, provincial legislation that impacts these uses, um, but as well just trying to, again, simplify them a bit and uh, where possible uh, take out uh, the need to have uh, specifically references to things like private clubs or, you know, churches, um, they're all assembly uses where people gather together. So yes, there's some overlap, but there's also uh, some simplicity to it as well. So those are the kinds of things that um, this group of changes is 
proposing. Um, the liquor establishment major and minor continue to exist pretty much the same. Um, definition of office takes on a whole bunch of uh, specific examples, um, just generalizes it more to, to professional, administrative, or government consulting rather than getting into the specific. Um, uh, Councillor Aaron, you had a comment, a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, just under office, I mean, the, the, the definition of an office that we're proposing seems to be fairly narrow in my mind. I mean, I look through all these definitions. Um, what's a healthcare facility? Or does that fit? That's different. Yeah, is that's something different. different. I've covered have, it here. Yeah, I haven't taken, uh, healthcare facilities are usually defined as a, as a separate thing, not as an office. Office is, is, uh, Different kinds of things. That, but healthcare facilities, I didn't see covered anywhere in here. No, I did not. I did not include healthcare facilities in this grouping. I can if you like me to, but I haven't to this point. Uh, is there any need to have it covered? Well, I mean, you know, I was. Else. It seems to be yeah. not covered. You know, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd bring you a brand new zoning bylaw to look at that we'd be starting from scratch. <laughs> but I sort of had to pick the ones out that were sort of in groupings that made some sense. I'm happy to expand um, to consider that because I think there's an opportunity in some other definitions for sure. It's not that I'm saying those other definitions don't need to be considered. They absolutely do. It's just, I needed to draw the line somewhere. So that's sort of as where I said. As long as it can be taken care of, I don't really have a huge problem with it, but you know, there, as there's the mental health facility over there, there's the, it's what's that? It's in the zoning bylaw already. I think what Corey's proposing is changes that are, are needed in this uh, across the whole of the zoning bylaw. So it exists already. So it exists and already covered. and it's defined. That's, that's what I'm saying. And it's got the mis As long as it exists. exists yeah. Oh yes. can happen as long as it's covered someplace. Yeah. Because there's going to be more and more little offices that show up that are private health care offices of, of some sort or something else. And and maybe if we ever get our other health care facility, who knows? Um, but all these things are going to show up. So as long as they're provided put someplace in the Thank you. Thanks. All right. Councillor Reed. <laughs> I think it, it's a good point and, and it's maybe something that if it is defined, then as, as Councillor Arlen says, if we're seeing more need for this in areas that currently maybe don't have it zoned, then that's something that we should look at. But it's certainly the provision for health services, both mental and physical health services um, in the zoning bylaw under the definition. And it may be a question that we need to expand potentially the zones that allow that um that would be as as needed kind of thing oh absolutely <laughs> churches do um awesome okay so that leaves us um i guess spectator yes. entertainment establishments i'm proposing to simplify that to entertainment use or exhibition and convention facilities those seem to be more commonly used terms now than spectator entertainment establishments. Not quite sure. It's just basically updating the language. Yes. And then um, as well, um, we, we, we touched on this at a previous meeting where there was the question asked, well, we grouped wineries, cideries and meteries together previously. And I have sort of broken them out differently this at this point because I'm seeing a winery as something distinct from a brewery, cidery, distillery or meadery. And that has to do with experience I've had in the past trying to manage these uses because there should be different regulations that apply to breweries and distilleries than do to wineries because of the nature of um, some of the fire and building code issues that go along with these uses. So separating the amount provides us the opportunity to be not overly restrictive on a winery where we don't have the same uh, danger of explosion and that kind of things from storing grains or large amounts of alcohol 
in a concentrated form, those kinds of things. So it allows us to 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 sort of separate those things out a bit. So that's that's why I have suggested it. And you may recall I mentioned earlier ancillary use um, was something that we had used interchangeably with the word accessory previously, but in the context of alcohol and alcohol production um, in British Columbia, ancillary use is used by the liquor control and licensing branch, whatever the latest name is um, in a very specific way. So I, I saw the opportunity to um, to mirror that here in our zoning bylaw. Okay. So that's that's my explanation of of those changes. So those are the things that are in attachment G, which of course mm -hmm. goes along with bylaw 1130 or 53. Pardon me. Um, I have Councillor Reed or Councillor uh, Mackenzie and Councillor Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, Corey, I, I do think that is uh, correct to separate the wineries from the other because uh, the others have the heat and everything else going on. We're a winery. I'm not aware of them heating anything up there. So I would think that uh, that is correct to do that. Thank you. I, I have had some very specific experience in my recent past that really highlighted uh, oh. the importance of this. So, yeah. You get blown up, did you? Yeah, well, I didn't, but, but boy, oh uh, boy, it was quite a discussion. <laughs> Arthur Reed had a question. Call uh, Thank you, Mayor Baker. Um, Corey, just two two points. Um, you'd mentioned about the assembly use that the the type of uses is, is is pretty much the same across all of the different types, which is why we're 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 combining it. But I I would argue that a church service on a Sunday is quite different to an exhibition centre in terms of volume and the hours of opening. So you mentioned that that could be regulated and um, in terms of its impact on the neighborhood parking and, and hours of opening. How would how would that be done if we did accept the, those changes? Um, we uh, so at this point I have in fact um, defined exhibition and convention facilities separately for that very reason. So it's a building or site used to provide permanent facilities for meetings, seminars, conventions, product and trade fairs and similar exhibitions. And that certainly opens the door for allowing that more specific type of assembly use in some zones, but not everywhere that you allow assembly okay. use. OK, that's perfect, because I, I, in your thing it said assembly use or, but I would support the, the distinctions that you've added there in terms of clarification. I think that those make perfect sense. Um, and I appreciate the explanation on the, the winery and the difference between the brewery and cidery and distillery. Um, my questions related to that, though, there's a couple of specific uses that don't seem to be related to safety um, and storage of products. So one is the restriction of um, public tasting retail sale of alcoholic products is limited to that which is produced on site for breweries and distilleries. However, the winery specifically does not have that restriction and is allowed to sell up to 50% of their products that are produced off site. So that doesn't seem to be related to safety. So I'm wondering why that one has that, um, that restriction. And then um, there's a comment about um, production activities that are not noxious or offensive to adjacent properties or the general product uh, public. I think that would equally, yes, it applies to breweries and distilleries, but there are times when that also applies to wineries and I cannot see the harm in adding that as a specific use for all of those operations. Nobody should be doing things that are noxious and offensive to adjacent properties, be they a winery, a meadery or a cidery. So, um, and the same goes for the mitigation of any negative impact on water or wastewater. I completely accept the argument that they may be more intensive users of water and there may be obviously products that get passed through um, and then there's maybe effluent that's discharged. But equally with the wineries, that still does happen. So again, it's, it's more of a, I don't think it does any harm to set that expectation for me personally, that um, the wineries should be equally as good neighbours in those two particular aspects as the breweries and the cideries or, or the meaderies and in fact the cideries as well because they're out of that one as well. Um, so if we can, if that's 
appropriate to include those, that would be great. But I would just appreciate a, a comment on the, the limitations on retail sale. Is that something to do with the liquor board or? Yes, absolutely. The short answer is 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 yes. It, it reflects um, the Liquor Control and Licensing Act provisions and how each of those uses has sort of evolved, starting right. out with their definitions. Um, there's also, it's interesting, usually uh, with respect to a winery, often they have multiple properties um, uh, or multiple operations uh, that contribute to that one label. Breweries and distilleries, that hasn't been the case as much, but but certainly, I mean, it, it's yeah. one of those things, this is sort of where it's evolved to, but I'm absolutely happy to, to make uh, general or, or specific use regulations for wineries and include those those um, additional things. And, and if you wanted to get into the liquor control licensing branches regulations, I could dig into those more, but that's that's where it comes so from. essentially where it came from. Yeah, I think then I mean, I, I appreciate that you've put in elsewhere that you don't need to dig into it because it's already stated in the liquor and licensing board. Then it's almost a situation to me of that that particular line could be removed because you're already covering it under your uh, the, the general definition, which is includes the liquor control and licensing act. So taking it might be one opportunity to have less words um, right. taking your the way that you've worked with with it. Uh, throughout the rest of the document. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. We got a motion for 1153. 1153. Going, Councillor Reed. That's food and beverage. I would uh, mention that the going to the public. I would accept that for first reading with the changes that we've discussed. Yeah. Okay. Um, and second, Councillor Scarrow. Any further discussion? Those in favour? Opposed? Motion carried. You got all that, Corey? I got it, I think. <laughs> then we I appreciate you guys turn. taking the time to go through this. I know it's it's a lot of stuff and we got a ways to go yet, but I, I think we made some good progress tonight. Thank you. We'll see you again before too long. I don't know if we... Are we going to do them all in... in um, and special councils, or can we do them when we have a short council? Yeah, we absolutely can ask them. A lot of the ones that will tackle are going to be fairly short. Yeah. Um, one, at a t one at a time per meeting? <laughs> this, this was, um, yeah, um, probably more you want to do at a council meeting with uh, everything else at a council. But if we did one or two, well, what what did we do? Three, four, six. They won't all, I think, take as much rationale as some of them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Of course, um, we don't want to be changing them on the fly either. We want to get them right or as right, right as possible. So. Well, Corey, can I just say something on before we get to height and grade? Um, there was just something in the report that was talking about the basic controls on height, grade, and I think there was something else, density and the idea of fostering innovation and things like that. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering if we could bring it back to the rationale of the OCP and how those controls support the goals of the OCP, um, because that's really where I think the why comes from in terms of um, protecting our neighbours, the environment, allowing everybody to live with a bit of a live and let live attitude. So um, I was just thinking about it today and um, that just sprung out at me. And I think there may be sort of some other councillors as well that maybe we just need to change the phrasing on that to pull that statement as to what the why are we doing this back to the OCP, if that's okay. That's true. That's Certainly, good. happy happy to take your instruction. Yeah. Unfortunately, I as I said, I, I've been ill the last couple of days, so I didn't get to put as much preparation in to my presentation this evening as I would have liked to, but I, I'm trying to find a way that maybe we can almost get ourselves a bit of a, uh, a check sheet, if you will. Okay, wh what is our intent and 
what are our principles and, and sort of review each one so that we'll be able to get like super quick at this eventually, but not quite there yet. But I appreciate that and I'll uh, I'll try to do that before our next one. Councilor Aaron. Yeah, the, yeah uh, I, I would echo those comments. I, I saw the same thing and I, I kind of object to the, the phrasing of that. It, it It doesn't go back to say, what we're trying to do here is serve our community. Uh, innovation's great in its place. I don't believe that this is the place for innovation. In the in building permit land and the, the building codes, that's the place for innovation for sure. Uh, in business and technology, but in this, I don't think it is. I, I think that when we're trying to establish guidelines, that every guideline that we look at, somebody's looking for a way to beat that <laughs> every time. So. I think that people would take offense at innovation because they're looking at it as I just got my lawyers out so that I can figure out how to beat their rule. But innovate. <laughs> so I think we need to, yeah. I think how Councillor Reed put it with, you know, I couldn't quite think about how it should be phrased, but um, reflecting the goals of the OCP, I think that's great. And I think we should, we should try to have, in going forward with some of this stuff, we should try to have that, uh, that you know, maybe that's the goal. Maybe it's not the goal with everything, but mm -hmm. we should try to have that goal because it makes it much easier to evaluate it. Of course. Because this is where we're trying to get to. You know, we know what we're trying to get to. So, you know, if it's the OCP, then we can take direction from the OCP to come back to this and say, okay. Yeah. Anyways, and I'll leave it alone. I think another difference is the OCP we look at every and and almost continuously uh, update every five years at least. We haven't done any updates on bylaws for a long, long time. And uh, we really, and we threw a lot of them together in a hurry just to get something on the book so that we, we could them. get some. We can yeah. tell the ones that we're adopting yeah. at 11.30 <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Corey, and I hope you get some more time off to recover. Yes. Thank you. Get well, Corey. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. We are adjourned. Yeah.